Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Hello, and welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson, and today it's, I'm really looking forward to today's podcast. While every generation feels its own time is extraordinary, and perhaps each time in history is unique, we today are facing a set of predicaments unlike any face before. Never has humanity been so far out past the edge of the Earth's carrying capacity. Never have we faced a globe without appreciable new resource horizons to cross over and exploit. And never has humanity had to envision a better future while moving away from a high-density energy fuel source, like oil, and towards a more diffuse energy source, such as the sun or the wind. All of this is shorthand for the idea that there's something wrong about our current national and even global narrative that's out of alignment with the facts and data that we can really easily access today, and perhaps even with our own internal compasses that let us know there's much more to being a fully alive and conscious human than our culture typically encourages. Here to talk with us about where we are in this story and where we're headed, and the joys and pitfalls we might expect to find along the way, is Charles Eisenstein, lecturer and the author of the books The Ascent of Humanity and Sacred Economics. I'm very excited to have Charles as our guest today because he writes beautifully on an area that I find very few have been able to or willing to explore openly, which is the intersection between economics and philosophy. Today we're going to explore his thinking on the shortcomings of our current monetary system and why he sees us at an important juncture where, should we want to, we have the opportunity to transition to one more authentic with the laws of nature and the post-peak oil future we're likely headed towards. I'm not sure where we'll end up in this conversation, but I do predict it's going to be a very interesting ride. Charles, welcome. I'm so glad to have you with us today. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Can we begin? Let's begin by characterizing the predicament in which we find ourselves. I've said something's wrong with our narrative, and there are a lot of pieces to that. A central one that can prove to be highly disruptive is when a culture's money system breaks down. I loved what you wrote about money as a sacred object and that our high priests and priestesses of money are in danger of being revealed as powerless frauds. Uh, can you please paint for us your picture of how money operates and why it's failing now? Yeah, I think everybody has a sense that the failure of money is, is an expression of the failure of something even deeper. But So money might not be the deepest thing that's failing, but certainly it's pretty central to everything else that's going on. Uh, but where I see, you know, we talk a lot about uh, peak resource use or maybe even more relevant, peak environmental degradation. But I think that underneath all of that, the failure is of the uh, basic mythology of our culture that money is an expression of. So you could even say that we're under peak, we're, we're going through peak separation, where the kind of money that we have today uh, pushes us into competition, whether we want to be there or not, because of the way that it's created and circulated as interest-bearing debt, so that there's always more debt than there is money. Everybody's competing for not enough money, uh, and it, it kind of makes into the truth something that isn't fundamentally true, which is the uh, kind of Cartesian version of the self, that were these kind of bubbles of psychology uh, competing with each other in an external universe for never enough. And the money system reifies that and uh, drags us into that way of being. Uh, and it also necessitates economic growth because if there's always more debt than there is money, the only way the debts can be paid, with that, well, what, what has to happen is either that lots and lots of people go bankrupt and default and the whole system falls apart, or you have to create even more money to pay the debts that were created from creating the existing money. As you and your readers all know, maybe even better than I do how, the, how this works. Um, and that can only continue as long as there's a basis for creating new money. But basically, and I can get into that a little bit more, uh, but basically what's happening is that our money system is deeply implicated in separation and growth. And both of these have reached their extreme. Therefore, money is not working anymore. Well, and money is certainly breaking down. I, I, you know, I love the image you gave us before of, of um, 
uh, how the, you know our high priest uh, Ben Bernanke is up and he's doing his rain dance, right? And he pours trillions of dollars into the landscape, and what's supposed to happen next is an economic revival, and it doesn't happen. So right. what we take from that is, uh oh, looks like our priest his magic is gone, and indeed it is gone. From my point of reference, I think that you know once you've hit where we are in the energy cycle and, you know, we're getting less and less high net energy back, it is just an absolute guaranteed prediction that you're going to get less and less economic activity, regardless of what you do with the monetary policy, whether it's tight or loose or all of that. Right. Ultimately, the real driver of economic activity is, is, is not money itself. It's real goods and services that people actually need and want and are going to consume going from point A to point B. And energy is just sand in the transmission of that as, as it's rising in price. So, so through that framework, we can see that that's an enormous structural shift, and um, you know, it's it's it goes beyond it goes so far beyond that. Of course, you know, the money system is breaking down. Europe's discovering that right now. We were going to hit a mathematical limit with our debt expansion, which is about four decades in the making. That was going to happen anyway, but we happen to have this whole peak oil thing happening at the same time. Plus, other resources are getting tight. You know, we've had global food supplies and aquifers, and we're looking at certain minerals. And there's just enough warning signs there to have any prudent person could look at this and say, gosh, this is, this is a new landscape. And yet, my perception is that our current cultural and political leadership is, is just so far away from understanding that the game has changed. Uh, that my personal assessment is that what they're going to do is continue to perpetuate the status quo as long as possible until it's painfully obvious that we can't do that anymore. Um, and uh, by painfully obvious, I mean reality has somehow prevented us from going any further. Uh, our liver gave out. You know, that's it. Yeah. Uh, we're all done as, in our, our time as alcoholics. So, uh, what in your, so from your writings and from your perspective, what is going on here? How can people like you and I and thousands, if not millions of other very intelligent, well-meaning people look at all of this data and go, oh, look at this. Something really has to change here. This is serious. And yet we find this gap between what we're seeing in the data and what we're receiving as messages and as um, cultural conditioning messages from, from mm -hmm. everything around us, in essence. What is going yeah. on here? Well, I mean, I think you're right that the, the, the power elite is very much trapped in their, um, you know, obsolete paradigms across the political spectrum. The, the, everyone's solution is we've got to reignite economic growth. So when housing starts rise, that's trumpeted as great news. No one really bothers to mention that we already have, like, double the housing capacity per capita that we did in the 1950s. Hmm. Uh, there's something like 19 million vacant units. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as long as we're starting to build new houses, then that's going to be employment and everything's going to be okay. So they're trying to, to squeeze a little bit more growth out of the system. But as you mentioned, it comes at a higher and higher cost. And it is very much like, like an alcoholic, um, you know, where in the early days you can maintain the addiction quite easily. You can uh, maybe you'll have to take a second mortgage on your house. You know, you'll have to lie to your boss a little bit, but... You know, you, you can kind of hold things together, but then eventually uh, things fall apart and, you know, eventually it's your liver. And you can only get that next fix at greater and greater cost. And so now to, you know, extend the metaphor to, to our system, we've gotten all the easy oil. Uh, we've depleted all the easy resources and, and the ones that we can easily uh, escape the consequences of, you know, up until now, or up until recently, you know, if you're creating industrial pollution, radioactive waste, et cetera, et cetera, social turmoil, well, you can move away from it. You can move to a gated community. You can escape it. But today, that's becoming impossible. The consequences are invading even the fortresses of the wealthy in various forms. And if we want to keep growth going, there's not that much more of nature that we can convert into product. Uh, and not much more human relationship that we can convert into services. And what we can convert comes at much, much higher cost. You know, you have to excavate the Alberta tar sands and, and devastate vast ecosystems. You know, I mean, you have to, have to clear cut the forests a fifth time or a sixth time and they're not really recovering anymore. Trees are dying everywhere and, and we just, the planet just can't take that much more of that. Uh, so, and then, the other thing, you know, sometimes economists will say, well, you know, we can grow the economy of services instead, and we can actually have economic growth with less energy. 
because of miniaturization and, and, and other technological innovations. So energy really isn't a constraint. And I think that to meet that objection, you have to kind of extend the peak argument to include uh, community as well uh, and understand that a lot of the growth in services has come at the expense of things that people once did for each other. Mm. Uh, you know, and that, and that technology, just like in the material realm, in the social realm, technology has extended the reach of monetized services. So, for example, people never used to pay for communication, but now we pay for almost all of our communication. People never used to pay for uh, entertainment, but now we pay for almost all of our entertainment. Even when, when my father was a child, he says that in his suburban neighborhood, the whole neighborhood every Sunday would get together with guitars and sing folk songs. Like, to imagine that happening in my neighborhood today is just mm -hmm. <laughs> ridiculous, you know, uh, because we all buy all of our entertainment. But there's almost nothing that we don't pay for anymore. So what's happening is that there's just not that much room for economic growth. We're never going to go back to the normal of the 50s and 60s when, like, there were years where there was like 7 or 8% GDP growth. Mm. No way. You know, now we're having trouble getting up to 2.5%. And that is just not enough to uh, allow lending. The banks would rather just sit on their money. Why would you want to lend it to build a widget factory when the market for widgets is flat, you know? Mm -hmm. So the money is stagnating it's, it's as excess reserves. No matter, like you said, no matter how much uh, they create, it's, as Kane said, it's like uh, loosening your belt and hopes you'll get fat. Hmm. Well, you know, it's um, interesting to me that uh, the period of time during which everybody who's in a position of leadership today grew up was uh, one of the more extraordinary economic periods of history where somehow in the decoupling of gold uh, from the international exchange system in 1971 through to current roughly about 2008 when it broke apart. But up to, let's say, between 71 and 2008, we were, we were increasing debt much, much faster than GDP. And that's even ignoring how all the ways I think GDP as a number has been fictitiously padded and, and otherwise uh, fuzzified. Uh, so, so we have, even by our own data, such as it is, this idea that, that we can compound our debt faster then we can compound the underlying economy in perpetuity. And that's sort of the environment in which that's the culture in which the people who are currently in power grew up. So that's normal to them. This very distorted, grotesque, um, Dali-esque landscape to them looks perfectly reasonable and square and flat. Uh, and it's not. It's, it's actually a, a very unusual period of history, and that's coming to an end. And there are really only a couple ways to end it. You know, this is debt we're talking about. So um, you pay it back or you don't. And yeah. uh, if you don't pay it back, you're defaulting on it in some form with uh, inflating or printing it away being a, a form of soft default that just spreads the losses over everybody instead of a few. Uh, so, so that's our choice at this point in time. And if we go the pay it back route, we have to accept a much, much lower standard of living than we've come to expect. You know, that whole born right. on third base and think you hit a triple thing. Right. We've come to expect that life, this is just how life is. Well, no, that's how it is when you're spending beyond your means. Spending beyond your means is really um, not a, a, a very normal place to live forever. Well, well the, third, the third solution would be to grow the economy so much that you can keep paying it back and have an increasing standard of living. But that's, and th that's one thing I really appreciate about your financial commentary, that you know, you're one of the few out there, really, that, that has integrated the understanding of the limits of growth into this money picture. That's the only way out, and that's not a way out anymore. Well, it just, it, it had, it. well, it, we have enough years under our belt at this point to say it hasn't been working for at least three or four years. And, uh, and, and you're right, there's precious little commentary and connection out there that says, wait a minute, maybe it's more than the debt overhang. Maybe there's some other factors at play here that, uh, how about this $100 oil? Anybody uh, thinking about that right now? I, it's, we've never had a single instance of economic recovery with oil prices at this level. It, it hasn't ever happened. So how it'll be different this time is, is a mystery. Um, and yeah, well, we all know that it won't be. And it's, it really is hard to know what's coming. You, you'd asked before about, like, how do we grapple with this as, as individuals when we see the um, world falling apart? You know, it's, it hasn't, the understanding that the world is falling apart hasn't reached everybody yet. It's still possible today to, to cling to the illusion that things are basically normal or that normal's coming back, but more and more people are realizing that it isn't coming back, 
and then the question is, well, what do you do with that? You know, I, I was uh, at a uh, conference a while back. It was a uh, for some strange reason, I, which I don't understand. I was invested. To sp- I was invited to speak to a group of investors, mm-hmm. and the the guy before me he spoke on, uh, you know, how the financial system is going to collapse. So you better buy gold, he said, and it better be physical gold, you know, like actual bars of gold. That's the only safe investment. So then I, I, I gave my talk after that, and someone in the Q and A asked me, "Well, what do you think about gold, Charles? Do you agree with that?" And I said. If things fall apart to the extent that the U.S. dollar no longer has any value, the worst investment you could have, the worst thing you could have would be a whole lot of gold in your basement because men with guns will come and take your gold. Those men with guns will probably be the government, but could be warlords, thugs, thieves, and so forth. Unless unless your temperament is cut out to be a warlord and hire your own private army, to protect your gold in your basement and then deal with the fact that they're probably going to think, well, why don't we just take his gold? You know, unless, you, but unless you're like, you're cut out to be a warlord, uh, gold is probably the least safe investment you could have uh, under those kind of conditions. And the only thing you, that you could invest in that would, that could survive such a transition would be to invest in your community, to, uh, in, to create a reservoir of, of gratitude out there uh, to be someone who's valuable to other people, who has valuable resources, valuable skills, which you share. Um, basically, the only kind of wealth that per- can persist through this transition is is what you give. Wealth would be how much you've given. And this uh, shift, this different approach, also resonates with where we want to go anyway. You know, even when people achieve a lot of wealth and they've kind of won this war of all against all that's dictated by the money system, what do they want to do? They want to give. It's, it's, it's in our nature to want to give. And I think on a deep level, what we're seeing is a, a, a resurfacing of a much more ancient kind of economy. All ancient economies were gift economies, where indeed the wealthiest person was the one who gave the most. That's how you became a big man. Mm-hmm. in a potlatch society. And so our, our desire, and it, even on a deeper level, it goes down to, to understanding that we're not these separate beings in an objective Cartesian, Newtonian universe, but that uh, something of you is in me, and that our beingness is interdependent. And, so, well, this is something that I, I think in the United States um, is a particular challenge. Uh, so I, I have the opportunity and the fortune to be able to travel and, and see other cultures and, and do things. And uh, we have a particularly, we, United States, have a particularly isolationist sort of a view. And it, it's heavily reinforced in in our practices here, whether it's um, creating false dichotomies and, and a political divide so that we can't get along there or through any of their isms or, or divisions or whatnot. But uh, it really struck me. I was talking with a woman who was a psychiatrist in one of the tonier um, zip codes in California, and she said that it was her experience that her practice was actually booming because she has all these people who are hanging on by their economic fingernails, but there's still two cars in the driveway. The lawn is perfectly manicured. Everything looks great. But they don't – the people who are coming to her, they can't even talk about their difficulties with their own family members sometimes, or certainly they can't let their neighbors know. There's like this – extraordinary pressure to just sort of deal with it as their world is collapsing around them. And in fact, that is, um, historically speaking, a really, really unusual condition to find yourself in. And I would suggest it's unnatural. Yeah. Yeah. The, this alienation from, from everything, you know, first from community uh, and now from even the family. It's, it's really, it's, it's truly remarkable that, that now like, like a confidant, like wise advice, that's something that has been commodified. You, you pay for that today, and you don't get it, you know, from the people who are most intimately involved. I mean, th- this is kind of an extreme, but but still, it's. I think it's um, symptomatic. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's something I've I've become aware of uh, a lot recently. Is that on some level, almost everybody I talk to has, has got the awareness that something's wrong, maybe desperately wrong. Um, some of them have the intellectual framework. Some just have a, a raw feeling in their gut. And that, that something in our narrative that we've agreed to live by is just broken. Um, 
And I'm not just referring to the American narrative anymore at this point, or European or Japanese. I mean the human global narrative. You know, I mentioned it before. The data suggests, yeah, we're past the carrying capacity of the globe. What this means to me is that there needs to be, um, if you say you're past the carrying capacity, next sentence is, well, I guess there's going to be fewer humans at some point in the future. Um, or we're going to have to really enormously change our habits and practices. Yet the deepest messages we're still giving to ourselves every day in the newspapers and on TV and in the, in the media and whatnot, uh, in, the, in, in our religious texts, are things like, well, be fruitful and multiply. Um, our economy needs to grow this year and next year and every year forever. Uh, that resources are there to be consumed. Yeah. And, and none of these things are truly sustainable, meaning they can continue at their current trajectories for even another 10 generations. Um, yeah. Whether it's this year or in 100 years of the final consumption of a non-renewable natural resource, is it. That's it. It's gone. So are we not also wired somehow as humans to really care about our children? I mean, really, and, and those who come after us, even if we don't know them? Is not stewardship somehow a human capability? I think we're caught in the grips of a myth or a story. And, and you put your finger on it, you know, the, the be fruitful and multiply. Uh, I, I call that myth ascent that says basically that we were once very few on Earth, basically animals, helpless and ignorant. Then we developed, thanks to our big brains, science and technology, and we covered the Earth. We transcended natural limitations. We harnessed natural forces. We turned the whole world into ours. We domesticated it. Uh, and the story says someday our conquest of nature will be complete. Uh, we'll have synthetic food. We'll uh, upload our consciousness into computers. We'll conquer all disease. We'll conquer old age. You know, we'll move on into space. And we won't need nature anymore. We'll have completely transcended it and fulfilled our destiny. And, mm. and that, that narrative, it, it is all over the place in very subtle ways. We don't explicitly talk about conquering nature very much anymore. But the very fact that we refer to nature as resources also comes from that mindset. And that is becoming obsolete in so many ways. The money system is part of that, um, of that myth. It embodies it and it enforces it. For one thing, uh, because it generates, necessitates, compels economic growth, uh, the conversion of nature into property, into goods and services. And, and so the, the breakdown of the money system is one symptom that this myth or this story has run its course. Other symptoms are the outbreak of all kinds of incurable diseases. You know, in the 50s and 60s, it looked like we really would conquer all disease by the year 2000. Mm -hmm. It looked like it, we, were, we were, you know, we had just conquered smallpox and cholera and plague and polio and everything, and, and cancer was going to be next. But now we have all these new diseases, um, life expectancy starting to go down. Um, and so you look at any institution, it's facing a parallel crisis. And our trajectory of ascent is slowing down or maybe even beginning to descend. Now, will that descent be a crash or will we level off into some kind of steady state? That's an open question. But I think that if you look at the growth trajectory of natural systems like immature ecosystems, or children, you have a period of rapid growth and then it levels off. So one way I like to frame it is I like to say, okay, you know, maybe what's happening is that humanity is um, entering its adulthood. We've been children this whole time on Earth with a relationship to the planet of mostly receiving, which is the same relationship a child has to the parent. Uh, but when you enter adulthood, then your love relationship takes on a new dimension. You know, you fall in love with somebody who's not your parent, and you no longer simply desire to receive, but you also desire to give a gift to your sweetie, you know, and, and then at some point you desire to co-create. And I think that humanity is transitioning into that relationship to Earth, which means that we're falling in love with Earth. And I think it started as a mass consciousness movement in civilized society, um, Indigenous cultures are another matter entirely, but it started maybe in the 60s with the environmental movement. Uh, and when the astronauts 
uh, brought back those photographs of, of Earth, you know, the first pictures anyone had ever seen that didn't have borders drawn on them, the first maps that didn't have borders drawn on them. And people really were struck by those images and they fell in love with Earth and the environmental movement was born. Um, and so what, the problem that we have is that all of our institutions are still based in a obsolete, in an obsolete myth in the era of growth, of conquest, of ascent. But our, our desires and our, our intuitions are shifting. You know, we no longer are excited as we were 100 years ago to contribute to the conquest of nature. An idealistic young person 100 years ago, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm going to invent a way to cut down trees faster, and you'd be a hero for doing that. Mm -hmm. But today, the idealistic young people, they're going into permaculture. But the money system is still based in the past. You can still make lots of money if you can discover a way to cut down trees faster, but there's not a lot of money in permaculture. And that means that the money system is obsolete, and we need to change it to align it with a steady state or degrowth economy. And that's, that's what I write about. Um, but basically, none of the policies that are on the table, as far as you know, legitimate political discussion go, nothing, nothing's on the table yet. It's still way off in left field. You know this um, th this breakdown is. I've noticed it as a as at first. I was thinking of it as a cultural, but then I realized there is actually a generational breakdown happening. It, it first became startling to me about four years ago or five years ago when I was lecturing. Uh, the audience would be exclusively boomers, unless they accidentally dragged somebody young along. And then over time, it began to shift a little um, to younger and younger people. But the the the, the dichotomy that was that existed was that. Um, the boomers were typically asking me a flavor of this question, almost invariably, which is how can we preserve the status quo? And the questions would be framed in terms of who do we vote for so that we can keep this thing moving or where do I put my 401k or, you know, some version of like how, listen, I put my, invested my whole life into this thing. Can it please just not fall apart right now? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and young people were peering into the same system and saying, I see nothing to gain by preserving the status quo. You racked up all the debts, and I'm being left with all the all the wreckage from it. I no, I'm not playing along. So so off they go into permaculture or something like that. So there's a real generational gap here. That that idea of separation is 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 mm -hmm. alive and well, I think, across the ages. And I, I love this idea that that humans uh, were in at some sort of a point of initiation, one of those magic boundaries in life where if you had an intact culture, you would have somebody to walk you into manhood from boyhood or. Yeah. To womanhood from girlhood and here we are at our our adolescence and uh and i really truly believe that <clears throat> it's up to us to decide either to shift our culture on our own terms or or nature will shift it for us on her terms uh you know we face a future shaped by disaster or design i'm a design guy i think design would be awesome uh if we could do that here and the the trajectory i see though is that um, we are really still very very clearly headed towards a hard landing at this point uh, largely because it's so hard to shift a culture, uh, so hard for the status quo to let go of, of what it knows how to do. Uh, the institutional inertia, the personal inertia, the, all those things are, are still really much in play. Um, but I know that, that any of these big changes we're talking about that, that we need to have, so if we're going to be living a, a, as a part of, not a part from nature, that we're going to be living in balance in a way that, that we could see credibly what could be sustained for another thousand years if we're going to really maneuver into that that landscape uh that first step for me was required for me to break from the culture uh, and I, I in my own small way i did this right along with my family I, I left the comforts of the life i'd lived into the vice presidency the big salary nice tidy bedroom community actively yeah. crossed the grain of my culture and i did all these different things you know very bold Yet, um, has anybody who's read Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, and, and I think everybody should, that's a great book, uh, uh, he says that mother culture whispers to us so seductively and so comprehensively at all moments that it takes near superhuman effort to step back and even recognize what the messages are. Um, so my big break from culture was really nothing more than a series of actually very minuscule steps. Um, and, and yet we have to take those steps if we're going to uh, close that gap between what we know to be true and what our actions are at this point. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a disaster and design guy. Um, the designs are coming out. Like, some of them are in my book. Um, very few of them are original, actually. I, you know, pull them from various 
mm-hmm. traditions of economic thought, and there's, there's tons of solutions out there for every single problem that we face. And it isn't, they're not actually that hard to implement, theoretically. Uh, but it's just a matter of our, our, the inertia of our perceptions and our, our habits, you know, our ways of being. And how do those change? Those, you know, personally, I don't usually change anything in my life until there's some kind of crisis or disaster. It's actually not that I made any super, superhuman efforts to change. It was that I clung on to, to normal as long as I could until various events made that impossible. And I think on a collective level, we're going through that. You mentioned a, uh, initiation. You know, I think that, that that's the other thing that happens when one enters adulthood. If you go through an initiation where the world falls apart and even your identity falls apart. And, and again, like you were saying, you know, primitive tribes, they had these initiation ordeals where they would purposefully make your world fall apart. So you wouldn't, everything that had seemed so secure and so permanent and so real became revealed as, as nothing but illusion, which I think is a really good metaphor for what's happening today with the money system. You know, the things that seemed so real, I mean, nothing was more practical than a blue chip stock mm-hmm. or uh, a triple A bond, you know, mm-hmm. these things, you're, you, that's how you did it. You know, you bought your annuities, you know, your, your insurance, you know, your long-term investments. And that was security. That was so, that was the very essence of practical, of real. But now we're seeing that these things are, are just numbers in computers. They're just this swirl of bits. And people are almost having a sense of vertigo when they contemplate that all of this could dissolve. So I think it really is a, uh, and that's just the financial aspect of, of this. It really is an ordeal. Uh, and, you know, you could, you could call it a hard landing. And I think it will be frightening for a lot of people. But fundamentally, we still live on a very rich planet with uh, incredible abundance. And you see it even here in Harrisburg when I live here in Pennsylvania, you know, and last year the Susquehanna River rose 30 feet. And neighbors who didn't even know each other's names were basically flooded out of their houses, and they just started helping each other. And they were able to achieve things that would have seemed impossible a few days before. So I think that that our capacities are kind of dormant right now. But when a crisis hits, we'll become capable, like all the things that are politically impossible today. And if we really turned our minds to it, we could achieve them very quickly. We could reduce, if we really had our minds set on it, we could reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 90% in 10 years. Most of them aren't going toward anything that serves real human happiness anyway. You know, we wouldn't be worse off. People in, in India aren't less happy than people here, even if their ecological footprint is a tenth or a twentieth. Um, I was doing some research in, into organic agriculture. You know, usually it's criticized as well. It's kind of this, uh, you know, bourgeois uh, indulgence, um, but you couldn't feed the world on it because the yields are much lower. turns out that actually the yields are much higher per unit of land, but not per unit of labor. Mm-hmm. Per unit of labor, the yields are much lower. So we'd have to have lots more people having gardens and working on farms. But that's where people want to go anyway. So I, I just increasingly, when I when I look into it, I get the feeling that this scarcity is is an illusion. But it's also a very, if you could say, a very real illusion, because it's built into the money system. But it doesn't have to be that way. So here we are. We've got um, the, this idea that there are these big changes coming, whether our money system was due for a breakdown anyway because we've just been you know, putting too much gas into the engine too quickly um, for too long, or uh, whether we note that you know, we're at the carrying capacity of the planet or whether we note that you know, there's certain ecological limits that we seem to be hitting or whether w- we just note that um, it's time for us to settle into the idea that we've pretty much conquered the globe and, and it's time to, to shift into that next stage of whatever our existence is going to be, somehow we come to the idea that there are these big changes coming. And I was really taken, I just read an article, I don't know, maybe three or four months ago that, that noted that 
Um, when the USSR collapsed, alcoholism became the number one cause of death for people between the ages of 18 and 52. Um, and uh, no, 18 and 54, because the number was 52% of all deaths that were recorded were alcohol related. Uh, and, and so here's an example where you, we have a major economic superpower fell apart, right? Um, and still hugely endowed with all kinds of, of resources, uh, uh, natural resources as well, oil, gas, all that. But not the least of which is people still had their government housing. And for the most part, there was still government supplied food. So, so they had a place to live. They had food. They had the basics. So, But there was this narrative running for the people there, which was, I'm a pipe fitter or whatever I do. I'm a pipe fitter, and that job is no longer available. I am now useless. I'm going to numb myself and drink. So it wasn't the economic collapse that really hurt the people there as much as it was their response to it. It yeah. was the idea that I have a story running, that I am a pipe fitter, and I can't do that. I have nothing else to do. My purpose was embedded in that. And if you had a different story, this is, wow, I'm out of work. Look at all this free time I have. Here's this huge list of things I've always wanted to do in my free time, uh, and I'm going to grow as an individual extraordinarily in this period and take this as a gift. That's a different story from saying I'm useless, I'm going to drink myself to death. And fundamentally, it's the story we're carrying, not the circumstances that really dictate our experience of the time. So it, it, now I want to sort of turn to the idea, if, if however we've come to it, we've come to the idea that there's this big set of changes, possibly disruptive, possibly with things like scarcity and, and lack and, and other sort of scary things built into it. Possibly we're excited by all the changes that are coming. However, we see these changes coming. The question is, what can we be doing today? What should we be doing today in this moment to be, in essence, preparing ourselves internally uh, for living into that new future, whatever it happens to be? Yeah, I think that it really is the story that we're carrying uh, and the perceptions that we take into the into the um, into these changes, you know, I mentioned that that the, like the really deep story underlying all of this is the story of separation. That you know, the, the story that answers the question, "Who am I and why am I here?" The old story was, "Who are you?" is a skin encapsulated soul, you know, a Cartesian mode of consciousness in a robot made of flesh, and you're in this objective universe that operates by force. Uh, and um, the purpose for your being here, well, there isn't one, but you're programmed by your genes to survive and maximize reproductive self-interest. And that was, that was the story of self. And we're learning now that, I mean, that story is falling apart in so many ways. It's falling apart scientifically. Uh, it doesn't uh, align with quantum mechanics, the observer, mm -hmm. subject-object uh, distinction breaking down. It doesn't align with ecology doesn't align with new genetics, doesn't align with psychology, um, the new spirituality, and some of the new paradigms of economics, that that self and all that's built upon it is breaking down. And so the new story of self, I think really the answer to your question is that, that we need to align ourselves with the new story of self, which I would say you could call it the connected self. That says we're not these separate beings, but there's something of you in me. You could even say that we're the same being, you know, looking out at the world through different sets of eyes. And it's not just that we're interdependent. That's one word for it. But it's that my very being depends on the being of other beings. It's something that you can feel, you know, when you read about um, a species going extinct, you know, where you see the bulldozers knocking down swaths of virgin forest, or uh, you read about a child in Haiti uh, eating dirt because he's so hungry, it hurts. Why should that hurt? From the perspective of separation, it's irrational for it to hurt. It's happening to somebody else. In fact, it's good because that's one less competitor. But the fact that it hurts, I think, hints at um, our true nature, which, you know, as connected beings, which is really what... Uh, mystics and spiritual teachers have been telling us for thousands of years, you know, that that what that as you do unto the other, so are you are doing to, unto yourself. Uh, you could say that the expansion of self to include others is almost the definition of love. And I think that any way that we can align ourselves with that truth will help us in the transition and help society through the transition too. You know, sometimes, like a lot of people I speak to, almost anyone in the audience will raise their 
every every time I speak, someone will ask the question, well, what about all those people driving around in their SUVs who just don't get it? How can we make them get it? I think that most of the ways that we try to make them get it are counterproductive. Um, most of the ways are through guilt or shame. You know, how could you be using up more than your share of resources? But really, to change people and to bring them into a new story, you have to puncture the bubble of the old story. Love is antithetical to the story of separation. It doesn't make sense. It does not compute. I, I think about that uh, secret Santa last Christmas who went around to the Kmarts and paid down people's mm -hmm. layaways, you know? Yep. Someone goes in there and, and, and like, oh, someone has already paid this for you. Like, that just doesn't fit in. No one is getting an advantage over you by doing that. There's no strings attached. And it just makes the story of separation, the story of everyone is in it for themselves, everyone is trying to maximize their financial self-interest. I mean, this is an explicit ideology in economics. It makes that story a bit less compelling. And anything that we do to generalize that, you know, anything that we do that increases the amount of love in the world is it makes the story of separation less compelling and it eases the transition for the entire civilization. And that's not to say that political action and, and, and various kinds of activism aren't necessary too, but really what I'm saying is that even these small personal acts are also political acts. They're, they're part of this transition into the connected self and a civilization built on that self. It, it goes deep. I mean, it sounds like, you know, like, hey, I'm supposed to be talking about economics here. But I think we have to go all the way to the bottom because, because economics, as we know it, are built um, on a deep, deep structure. Plus, I think we understand that everything is changing. We just we, we have a, a, an intuition that the crisis is a spiritual crisis as well as an economic crisis, a political crisis, an energy crisis, and so forth. Well, the gift of any crisis is the opportunity to uh, to work with whatever comes up and what's been revealed. And uh, this idea of separation is certainly going to be revealed as as, as something that is. Um, really the source of a lot of suffering. I, when, when I work with, with individuals, um, I'm very cognizant of the idea that when I first had my, this worldview of mine shaken up, when you know everything was fine and hunky-dory and I had the entire illusion, and then I discovered some information and it shook everything to its core and led to extraordinary changes in my life, I'm, I'm sensitive and very empathetic to the idea that those first few months were rough for me personally. I was like, uh-oh, you know, very, very much a lot of anxiety and, and fear. And so I'm, I'm, I recognize the stage people will, will uh, not always, but sometimes uh, quite often go through. And that first stage is how do I protect myself? And it's very natural. It's like, uh-oh, everything just got shooken up. Let, let, me, let me make sure I've got shelter, food, warmth. And you do that. And then um, after a little bit of time, you poke your head up and you go, okay, I have that. And the world's still spinning. So now what? And that's where we go to part two of this story, which is to say, well, you know, it's really we're going to need community, which is a, a shorthand way of saying, I think, what you're saying, which is that um, it, it's time to step into the idea that um, we're going to be doing as well as our neighbors and vice versa. And that brings us closer to this idea that, that we're in this together. And then maybe it extends even further out of humans into the rest of the biosphere. And we say, well, you know, actually, I'm doing as well as my watershed is doing um, and the soil on my property is doing and and, yeah. the, and the depth of the uh, of the other connections that are out there around me in, in the ecological sphere. Um, you know, yeah. the, so so those all be, and we have our warning signs. You know, the frogs disappearing and being born with three legs tells us maybe not. Uh, there's not all cool with with uh, with a certain with the chemicals we're putting into the environment. So so, but through this, I think we come to this this point of. I hope we can get to this point of understanding that that we need to start understanding that the old way of doing things is really fundamentally not serving us anymore in total. And that it's a good time, a crisis is a great time to pick up the pieces of your life and look at it and say, this isn't serving me, neither is that. Oh, this still works. I like, I'll keep this. And I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to keep these four things. And it's time to say what works, what doesn't. But first you have to get to that point of saying what we're doing isn't working. And that's the first stage of the conversation, I think. Yeah, and, and it's, it sure helps uh, to realize that, that it's not working when the crises begin to to come home and you actually start seeing those three-legged frogs. You know, today, like you said, you know, our well-being is only as good as that of the watershed that we live in. 
But today, money, as we know it, uh, contradicts that. Money says, it doesn't matter what's happening to the watershed as long as you have enough money to, you know, buy organic food shipped in from somewhere else, you know, or to buy water or to move away, you know, like money can insulate you from what's happening to the earth. And you can make money, in fact, by destroying the watershed. So I think that part of, well, at least part of what I'm working toward is to realign the money system so that's no longer true. So one way to look at that is to, uh, you know, to, that we need to internalize these external costs. The, the business model of, of I get the profits and somebody else pays the costs. You know, even if you're a wholehearted believer in capitalism, that's not fair. You know, you should have to pay the costs, um, but and not the people downwind, downstream, or in future generations. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I guess I just mentioned that because I want to um, short circuit the conclusion that what we should really pay attention to is just the spiritual aspect. I think that that in itself, that, that, you know, the idea that the world is divided into two parts, spiritual and material, is itself a very toxic idea, and it's an example of, of separation. Um, so we, we definitely need to um, implement the spiritual or ecological understandings in every way, including in an economic, monetary way. And I'm, I'm glad to see that, that people are beginning to discuss these ideas uh, more and more, even in the mainstream, but there's still a long way to go. Well, the, my my great source of of, um, of hope is that the people I find having these conversations most deeply are are younger, uh, on average, uh, and they've really you know it, as with with bright, facile, energetic minds and uh, a real compelling interest in the future have looked into things and said we really have to do things really differently. And there's enough of them have have evolved far enough that they can look at the pure consumptive economy and say, oh, that's just, that, that looks soulless to me. I'm not interested. Uh, and, yeah. and maybe I'm just in a, in a hotbed of where this is happening, but I see it a lot and I'm very excited by it because there's a, a clear, um, some of these kids are thinking thoughts that would, would have been unimaginable to me to be having at 17, 18, 19, 20 years of yeah, age. Yeah. Tell me about it. Like, like, I'm like, I, I run into that all the time too. It's like nobody was having those thoughts when I was 20. Yeah. I imagine what thoughts they're going to have when they're, you know, in their forties. I know, so it's it's incredible. So I, I have, I really, I take great great hope from that. Um, and when we talk about uh, this idea of of building community, you know, I've I've come around the I to the idea that uh, I'm not going to hold any more workshops on how to build community because it's not an event; it's a process. And you build community every time you have an interaction with somebody. So all I actually care about are the actions that br bring us back together, whether it's the guitar playing that you talked about from your father's age or anything else that we might do sort of in community. And that's one of the things I see young people doing a lot of is uh, actually, you know, finding ways to interact with each other a lot and doing fun stuff, cool stuff, interesting stuff, permaculture things, nature walks, whatever they happen to be doing. But I see a lot of it. And, and to me, that is the, when I say, you know, how do we live? That's it right there. That those are the things we need to start doing. It's, it's not something to buy. It's not, it's not the next thing to, to read or, or anything is to literally get out of your house and go find somebody to do something with. And it could be anything, literally anything. I, I think th those are some first steps that make a lot of sense to me right now. The things that really build community, I think, are things that where you're not just consuming together. A lot of, I, I've seen a lot of attempts to build community or to create community fail because people don't need each other uh, and aren't giving each other any, anything, but they're just getting together and consuming drink, consuming entertainment, consuming food, um, but they're not co-creating. And they're not creating ties that you have in, say, you know, in Pennsylvania, in an Amish community, where you really need the other people in that community. You can't just delete them from your friends list um, and pay for the things that they were once giving you. But there's an actual uh, dependency, which we aspire you know, when people aspire to financial independence, they're aspiring to not need anybody. And I think that community is impossible when we don't need each other. Mm. And, and that community, in fact, is woven from, from gifts. When, when, we, when you give somebody something, then it creates a tie. That person wants to give you something, too. So there's an ongoing relationship which is not present in a financial transaction. Um, and that's why I say that economic growth has happened... Um, through the strip mining of community, 
the conversion of these mm. bonds into, you know, free chemical energy kind of mm-hmm. you know, into money. Uh, and, and that's starting to reverse, as you say, with the young people, you know, a lot of what's going on is they could be paying for entertainment, but they're getting together and making films, you know, putting them on YouTube, um, or they're doing reskilling kinds of workshops. You know, they're teaching each other new skills. They're, they're doing things. They're rec- reclaiming things from the money economy. And I think that that, it's really interesting that, that anytime you, uh, find a way to replace money transactions, with self-sufficient or gift transactions, like if you make a neighborhood child care co-op uh, or some kind of way to share share things in the community, uh, zip cars in Baltimore, any, anything that um, reclaims these paid services, you're actually reducing GDP by doing that and thereby hastening the financial crisis because it just intensifies when there's no new goods and services, and in fact, the economy is shrinking. You know, all of the, even Craigslist, you know, um, by one estimate, it's, it's so far replaced something like $100 billion in ad revenue. But that all comes off of GDP, too. Um, and, and so, uh, or open soft, or open source software. So all of these, so they're not all on a community level. Some of them are more on a global level. But all of these are ways of, of reclaiming uh the commons and reclaiming relationships and and so they they hasten the demise of the financial system but they also mitigate the severity of the collapse because now we have some wealth that is hasn't been incinerated uh, or when you reclaim nature from when you protect it from development um, or stop a pipeline or or do anything to prevent something from being converted into a product, then you're also hastening the collapse. In a way, the conservatives have it right. You know, sh- shutting off the uh, oil development in the Alaskan wildlife refuge does hurt GDP, mm-hmm. and it does cause fewer jobs to be created. But that's good, <laughs> because if these, if we can preserve some uh, biodiversity and some habitat and some some of the wealth of Earth, then it'll be much easier to rebuild after the collapse and we won't we won't have to have a really hard landing with billions of casualties there's still a lot of richness left i think oh there's so much and and i love this this is very good practical advice how do we live into this you go out and find something that would have taken money before and do it without money so in uh entertainment hold a book club Everybody gets the book, right? Go to the library and get the book if you want to spend no money and then talk about it. Hold a salon on, on a set of topics. Uh, figure out how to do the child care collective you talked about or whatever this thing happens to be. You're building community. You're getting resilience. You're forming those threads with each other. Uh, gift things if you can. Uh, mm-hmm. Along the way, what's happening subtly is that we're rewriting the narrative of who we are and how we are and taking it away, reclaiming it, if you will, from from the main narrative, which says you are a device that needs to accumulate as much wealth as you can, and if you do that, you'll be really happy, and if you fail at that, you'll be miserable, and uh, stripping it of some of its power, which is an important thing to do here. Yeah. When you're, when you're embedded in a gift community, then it's just insanity to think that more for me is less for you. In a gift community, if somebody if somebody has some great talent or some great success or some some good fortune that's good for you too because they're contributing to your life Mm -hmm. and and it's just much easier to understand that we're not these separate beings in in a hostile universe oh how comforting that would be well listen this has been a fabulous conversation we've been talking with charles eisenstein author of Two books, The Ascent of Humanity is the newest one, and also Sacred Economics, both uh, excellent books. I'm not all the way through Ascent of Humanity yet, but the introduction and first couple chapters, fantastic. Sacred Economics is the most recent one, actually. Oh, sorry. Um, Sacred Economics being the most recent one. Okay, so, uh, Charles, how can people find out more about you and follow your work and get these books? Um, Well, I think the best way is uh, charleseisenstein.net has links to my other sites, Um, and I will mention that the text of both books is online as well as in print. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you uh, are a, if you are practicing a radical reduction of money in your life, you need not buy the books. Mm-hmm. 
most people do anyway, but you never know. Okay. I, well, I like that model. It's it's uh, it's been. I hope it's working for you. It's worked for other people I know. So um, fantastic. And uh, well, thank you so much for spending the time to talk with us. I hope we can do this again. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C H R I S M A R T E N S O N.com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action. Thank you.